this was certainly not not something I expected, but a little bit ironic to me. I thought Mendy was probably our most press resistant player in this game, and that's not something we normally say. And obviously, not having Alaba in there hurt. That was kind of a last minute decision, or like two hours before the game, we found that out. Um, that was going to hurt our ball progression a little bit. But I thought, you know, Barca's, in particular, their counter press, I thought was even better than their the actual press itself. But we really struggled. And I think that was part of the reason why, like, especially like, even if you look at some of the sequences where Modric is trying to bring it up the right wing, and he's just, Barca defenders are just converging on him, three, four players. He barely has an outlet to squeeze through. He actually got out of a couple of ones really brilliantly with just some, just because he's Modric and he's individually brilliant. But I thought we really struggled with that aspect. But the thing is, like, with this Barca team, and I think this will be a struggle for them no matter what, like, if the, whether these are all good signs for them or not, I think this will be a struggle for them in general. That Xavi has a clear way he wants to play. But if he, if they're just like, I mean, if you look at the 3 2, it's, the three two that we scored, that was the Vinny dummy, right? To to Fede Valverde. And I know I'm jumping all the way all the, to the to the extra time. But again, this podcast is gonna be all over the place. It's two two in that situation. I don't understand what they were doing defensively to be just kind of exposed like that. And this was not even unique to that situation. That you, they were their defending was was horrible. And like in in many cases if you're you're conceding a goal like that or conceding chances like that, you're probably chasing the game in most scenarios where you're like desperate to score. They were just playing so risky, like with so like wingers high up the pitch, not doing much tracking, leaving basically Araujo and PK to defend themselves, which good luck with that. And and I think that's gonna be a problem for them. Like because Chavi will not change the way he plays. Like he just this, they, they go all gung-ho, and I don't think their co- aspect of control on the game and and their structure like just high up the pitch is good enough for them to compensate for that. And even like the transition defense sequences were okay, but like, you know, admittedly we have Vinicius Jr., which is kind of like a cheat code in a lot of these situations, and you saw what happens when he came off. But uh, I think that'll be that'll be an issue moving forward for them. But what what is it? What else stood out to you in that first half, Om, that you want to hit on, like from a tactical perspective? Well, I I am lower on Barca's press than you were. I think there were stretches where it looked fine and we weren't really breaking through. I mean, the the biggest stretch comes to mind at the beginning of the second half, for like ten to fifteen minutes, nothing was happening, and Courtois was just playing long balls all the time. I think a lot of those unnecessary. But ultimately, there were just too many breakdowns. There were too many breakdowns from Barca's end for me to look at that press and think it's secure and we're just getting through one or two times. Like, And it wasn't just, you know, brilliant play. It was a lot of like playing into Casemiro and people were just completely late to step to him because I think they expected him to have a different day. But credit to him, this is the best on-ball performance I've seen from him, I think, since the 2018 European Super Cup versus Manchester United. I don't know if anyone even remembers that game, but I remember at the time, we the way we won that, everyone came away and it was like, Casemiro's made his on-ball evolution. Like, it's going to change everything. Like, everyone was like, this is the game. This is where the debate ends. And then, like, that just didn't happen at all. But it was that kind of level of performance where he was seeing everything, right? Like he knew exactly who was coming to him. He picked out all of his passing options beforehand and his first touch, the accuracy of his passing and the movement off of it was all just spot on. I really don't have many complaints. If I have any complaint, it would be maybe what he was doing defensively on the Ansu Fati goal, but on ball, it was just a really crisp, clean performance from him. And I maybe maybe that also affects the way I see Barca's press because usually Casemiro isn't like this, right? So the fact that he was playing that way, on top of the fact that he has Kroos and Modric ahead of him or to the other side of him, yeah, I guess it's going to be pretty difficult to press us. And a lot of the best sequences came from Casemiro touching the ball, playing through the press, making things happen. Then obviously he had his ball carrying action at the end to set up the third goal. So this was, I mean, it was a really good game for Casemiro. He usually gets up for Clasicos, which is why if there's ever a debate about whether he should start every single time there's been a Clasico, and this goes back to 2016, I've always wanted him to start. These are always where his best performances are. And on ball, 
it's it's the best I've seen in a very, very long time. I mean, I don't know if you can go back in the memory bank and find someone a game earlier than the 2018 European Super Cup, but that was the first one that came to mind. I'll, I'll do you even one better. I don't even remember that game. I just remember that we played them. I actually have like maybe flashbulb memories of of that game, but I don't. I barely remember. I, I what I do remember from that Manchester United game was their fans were coming in hot and heavy on Twitter because they they thought that they were entering a new era and uh, they were super excited. And then we just we we won that game pretty comfortably. Um, I I agree. With, I was actually going to make that same point about Casemiro. I thought. When I think back to Casemiro in Clásicos, I genuinely, from what I remember, come away from after almost every Clásico thinking Casemiro stepped up today. I, got, I think he does well in these Clásicos, generally speaking. And I, I thought he was good on the ball today, too. Um, funny enough, like, and I was going to comment that this was, I think, part of the reason why we couldn't get a foothold of the first half, even though I think, you know, we were obviously just blitzing dangerous on the counterattack. Cruz wasn't as involved in this game, and... And I think him and Modric were kind of uncharacteristically off. And again, I, I am pretty sympathetic to the fact that they're allowed to have off days in in a game every now and then, especially when you're traveling to Saudi Arabia, which is a game for a game that the only thing that is really at stake is is money. Um, I'm okay. it's okay. Like it's you know, I'd rather him kind of have a dip in these games than you know in the league or in the Champions League or whatever. You know, there were a couple moments where both Modric and Cruz kind of were dwelling on the ball and they didn't really kind of see someone sneaking up on their blind side, whether it was Nico or Gabi, and they just take the possession from them. Uncharacteristic things like that that, you know, can be chalked up to fatigue, travel, you know, whatever. Uh, but again, I thought they both grew into the game in the second half to some extent. Um, the other one, like when we're talking about press resistancy, like... Can you give me your read on Mendy in this game? And you look at the numbers. He had five dribbles completed, more than Vinicius. Very, like, his ability to, when he gets the ball on the left flank, there were so many sequences where he's shielding the ball, trying to just keep it in play because there's, like, three Barca players on him in the corner flag. You remember those sequences, right? He does, I mean, I think he did pretty well in those situations. Not so much you can do. You can kick the ball out of bounds or whatever. I think Real Madrid also ultimately lost possession on a couple of those sequences, but... When he's being pressured on the wing, his ability to just kind of drop his shoulder and then cut inside uh, and just find his w- find a way out of pressure. He comes all the way to the middle at times. He comes he comes pretty far if he needs to. Whatever needs to be done, he gets out of that space. Do you feel like there's an evolution there, or do you think do you think that's just a matter of like he because he can carry the ball because he can kind of shield players off? He's he's going to be good at that, generally speaking? Or do you feel like maybe he's improving that situation? What's your read on that? I don't even know how to analyze the roulette other than just pure chaos. There was like so much happening. And then I was looking at that replay uh, and there was a French commentator. I think I sent you the clip. And I think Dembele has a chance. It's blocked. Ball comes to Mendy. The French commentator is going crazy. And then Mendy does like a roulette and a sidestep out of the box and pass out of the back. The French commentator is losing his mind. And I didn't know what to make of it. It was just pure chaos. Um, so I don't even know how to analyze that, but let's leave that aside. What do you make of his press resistancy? And do you think has, it has improved or what, what's your take? I don't know whether I can say it's improved based off of this game. What I will say is it doesn't shock me when I see Mendy pull out really good looking carrying sequences, because when he gets his timing down, when he drops the shoulder and the touch isn't too heavy, his explosiveness on the mar- off the, off the mark is like it's a lot to handle and if he just keeps getting to the ball before you he can take out one two three four players i thought his footwork was really good today it's not it was it's not like it was just a case of him running into space and i think that is where it's a little iffy with him and some days he has it some days he doesn't so i i'd need to see more of it to say but i do think this was like a really really good performance from him on the ball in a lot of aspects The other thing for me is like with all those avenues we had inside, it just felt like Barca were a little late and a little uncoordinated in actually trapping us to the wing, right? Having Mendy turn inside like that is what you want to happen with him. And the fact that he was able to take the space on certain occasions, it just felt like they weren't able to like constrict the net around the wing as quick as they wanted him to. But I think he still did well. 
And I just, I think it's a case of let me see multiples of these performances of Mendy being like having that comfort, especially cutting inside. And I'll say like, I think there's an evolution there when it comes to whenever Mendy is able to face play and his progressive pass game carrying that way. I've always been high on Mendy in that sense. Like my criticism of him from press resistance perspective, it's always been more like contextual. It's about like, where is he being pressed from? What is his body orientation like? And today he was just good in pretty much every way. So when you look at that first half, and I, I'll pull up some clips. We'll do that thing where we'll go over some of the clips and some of the goals and stuff. But let's say you're going into halftime. What is something that is glaring obvious to you that you think that needed to be changed at halftime? Um, just based on how it unfolded. Was there a substitution? Was there a structural change? What did you see that needed to be done? I didn't think anything needed to be changed because the way that first half ended, I felt like we were, we had easy control. It was like the first maybe 15, 20 or so minutes. It felt quite even was still trying to figure out what I thought about that press, but it just felt like Barca faded away, especially after that goal. Like obviously they didn't give up, but it almost kind of looked like they gave up. I mean, they were just dispirited at that point, right? Like nothing was going for them. They weren't able to generate anything offensively. And then Busquets of all people, gets robbed by Benzema, plays Vinicius in, great goal. At that point, I was thinking this could get ugly for Barca, honestly. And then they came out with a good spell. You know, they made certain adjustments. They had Ansu Fati came on, which which made a bit of a difference. I will say that now that I'm thinking through this, though, like, and I don't know what we could have done. Like, I don't know if there was anything we could have done. But the thing that was worrying me in that first half was Luke de Jong, the match, matchups he had in the box, initially versus Nacho. And we'll have to get to Militao, who, did, who really didn't have the greatest day, which, you know, if we were relying on someone to carry our box defending, it would be him. But that was the matchup I was worried about, right? I don't think it would have been different if Alaba was in. Like, if you go through and look at his aerial dual success rate season after season, he's always, like, in the bottom 10%. It's just not a strength, right? That's not why we signed Alaba. Um, and I think this is just a vulnerability that exists in defense. Usually, you know, we might deal with it by... If we're not high pressing, defending more in a mid block, right? So we're, we're, we're doing a lot more to prevent the, the opponent from getting to areas where they can put balls in the box. But versus Barca, we were just defending in a straight deep blocks. So, so much was going to defend on our box defending. And it, it, there were already some cracks you could see in the first half. And I thought Luke de Jong was good. It was why, despite the fact me liking Fatih coming on, I didn't know if taking him off like in a direct sub was necessarily the best decision. It worked out in the end. But yeah, that was my main worry. Otherwise, I, I, I felt pretty comfortable about what was happening. Um, obviously felt a lot more uncomfortable once the second half started. But yeah, I, I wouldn't have changed that much. Maybe try to apply a little bit more pressure on, on deeper ball carriers so like they can't get to the box that easily to deny deliveries. But I think the way the first half went is how Carlo probably would have envisioned it. And he would have come away with that like fairly content, I think. Well, you kind of hit it on at the end there. Applying a little bit more pressure, I would have looked at that because there were too many sequences where I thought we could have counterpressed them and won the ball back quickly. And we just, we just turned our back and we just walked away. Like there was one in, in the second half that really stood out to me where Vinicius plays a, a through ball into the half space where Mendy was making an underlap run. He overhits it and Alves just takes it. And instead of just pressuring him and winning the ball back, we all just turned our backs and started to jog back without even realizing we could have really won the ball back in a dangerous position. So I thought we we were almost too passive in certain situations. Like, I get that you want to absorb pressure against this team and just absolutely burn them, burn their high line. And we did that on numerous occasions. So I'm not I'm not saying, like, you don't continue to do that. I'm just saying there were definitely moments where you could have made them a lot more uncomfortable. The other thing is, like, Ter Stegen... The scouting report on him has been out for a long time now. Man-to-man, high press, mark every single person except for him, cut off every single passing lane you could, and just dare him to do something. And he gives it away every single time. Twice we did that in this game, and he kicked the, he kicked the ball out of bounds or straight to one of our players. I would have liked to have seen more of that, um, and we just didn't get to see enough of it. Uh, it's ironic that Ansu Fati hurt us in a very Luke de Young way, and that was getting in on the end of a header that we just let him run free on. And uh, I joked about this, but it was like deep down I knew that it was going to, it was going to haunt us, that once de Young started scoring the last two games leading up to this, 
it was clear he was warming up for his annual good game against Real Madrid. And that, and that, uh, those two, it was two headers that he had in this game that was warning signs for us and he ultimately scored. I will say, I don't care if you're Luke de Jong or if you're Ruud van Nistelrooy or if you're Marco van Basten himself. We can't leave him open the way we did. We can get to the marking if you want. I mean, we can break down those two goals in particular. There were also sequences outside of that where I thought our marking was poor, whether it was defending a set piece, whether it was just marking a simple cross. I think Nacho and Militao had good interceptions and certain good reads, but I think it, there was a lot of miscommunication. Like I, On that second goal that Barca scored, a lot of blame I saw was on Militao, right? And I'm not saying he was flawless, but like if you look at Ansu, it was Men- Mendy's original marker. Mendy just stops tracking him last minute, and that's where you see Casemiro like yelling at me- yelling at Militao, like "Why did you leave him go?" And Militao points to Cas- uh, to Mendy, and he's like, "That was his man. I was marking the near post." I'm not saying any of these players are absolved from blame, I- but I did see a lot of miscommunications and just frantic clearances and a lack of leadership at the back. That, for, quite frankly, as much as we love Alba, doesn't necessarily get magically solved if Alaba's there because it's not like that's a strong suit either, right? But that so worries me. And it is kind of funny because Barca of years past, maybe they're not a team that would threaten you in the air um, since PK retired especially. But, you know, you look at Ferran's got some height now. You got Araujo throwing some bodies around Luke de Jong. So they can they can do a little bit more damage in that sense than they could in years past. But it's the, I don't know if there's much else to be said about it, Om, but the marking in the boxes is, is worrisome to me. One thing I will say is that a lot of what Xavi has lacked early on as head coach, especially given what he wants to do, is real threats in behind. And he, he this is like before Memphis got injured and everything. He would play Memphis as a number nine, and it just didn't work out, right? With the profiles he was playing with on the wing, there was barely any threats. And what we've seen consistently throughout Xavi's tenure is like the only one who is giving them juice off the shoulder in the ways that you really want them to is weirdly enough, Frankie de Jong. And I know Frankie has like a lot of box to box ability. This is a tool in his game, but he came as a player from Ajax who was a double pivot player where the majority of his value was coming as a carrier and passer for deep. And I still think that's the way you should use him, but it's, it's never really worked out that way at Barca, right? Like he can't play as a single pivot. You'd want to play him in a double pivot, but that's just, it's never really necessarily worked out that, that way. And, you know, since essentially from like Setien, like De Jong has been like shoved into like a more advanced interior role. And he's kind of been adapting to that. And so what we have on the first goal, I think the most important thing is Frankie making that run into the channel, which gets them close to the box. We're not really able to clear. And then, yeah, the marking wasn't good, but also I think, the awareness from Militao should be there. Like the way he cleared the ball, like he should have just booted it straight out. Instead, I saw a lot of people saying there was nothing he could do. He could try to clear it. I I don't know if I necessarily agree with that. He did not have to try to angle that back towards play, right? He should have, if not had a check over his shoulder beforehand, he should have had a sense like from like the corner of his eye, he should have known Luke de Jong was on him. And he shouldn't have tried to clear the ball the way he did. I mean, it's on screen now. Keon showing the goal. It's a great run from Frankie. Actually headed it out. It wasn't a clearance. And then, look, Militao knows he's coming. I don't know why he tried to clear it out the way he did. It's, it's either just a tap with his toe to put it out of touch on the sideline or just trying to boot it, like, just straight in front of him. Like, it was just a lack of awareness there from him. And, um, I mean, there was more of that throughout this game. So, yeah, I mean, there were, there were a lot of moments like this from both sides when it came to the defending, bar maybe Araujo and, you know, maybe other individuals you want to pick out. Like, in terms of, like, individual play, there were a lot of mistakes on the day. And it wasn't the highest quality in that sense. Yeah, I mean, I thought this was really poor from Militao because you can see it. He knows the entire time exactly where De Jong is. He's right here. Militao even says, asked, I think, Casemiro to drop deep, but it was no way Casemiro was going to take that man. And Militao, no, he just, I don't, maybe he just thought, okay, the ball's not coming that quick or it's not coming there or De Jong's not going to attack it as urgently, urgently as I think he will. And so it, that I, that was really poor from Militao to me. Um, do we want to say anything about the goal we scored? The first one, I'll have it up on the screen. We kind of already talked about it. I mean, 
Benzema picks Busquets' pockets. That's really satisfying. Modric makes a quick right pass here. Beautiful through ball to Vinny. He's so quick and uh, and just buries it. Anything to add? <laughs> I mean, it's pretty straightforward, that one. I mean, I think the most interesting thing is just, like, the quality of that finish for Vinicius. Like, this is why... I and a lot of others, mainly like analytics oriented people are like so agnostic about being able to pin down like finishing ability and be able to say some players have it, some players don't because Vinicius went from literally one of the worst in Europe, which, you know, very few of us thought was sustainable, but he went from that to being someone who is like literally maybe the best finisher in the world. Just based on just based on the past goals we've seen in terms of the angles he's finished from, the variety of finishes on this one, Araujo is doing like the last thing he can, which is to like push him off balance without fouling him. So he gives him a little nudge. Vinicius is clearly just tilting off balance a little bit. He's on his weak foot and he's able to side foot that with power sort of angling it toward like the top corner roof of the net area from the near post. Like that's a ridiculous finish. And it just remains wild to me that he went from where he was to this now, where anytime he's in front of goal from whatever angle, he's a threat to score. And do I know how sustainable this is going to be? I have no clue because it's just such a wild swing. And it's why, like, if you're wondering why there there are certain people who are like, I'm going to wait before, I, I say something about this finishing streak. I'm going to wait before I say I know what this player's finishing ability is because we're talking about multiple seasons now where things have been drastically different, like multiple seasons of poor finishing versus over half a season now of this. It's like, what do you make of that? How, how do we decide how much of the, the leap is real? How much will stay? Only time will tell. I've seen enough. It's real. I've seen enough. I don't, I don't need to see anymore. He's he's double the right. SG for the rest of this. I I I don't know how this happened, but I I've become the Vinicius fanboy, and now you're the doubter. I need to straighten you out here. How is this doubting? I I mean, re- regardless of what happens, he's going to be a good goal scorer. But this is like this is crazy. Like this is you know point three point four xg and like a and and scoring like you know maybe double that rate on a per ninety basis. It's crazy. So you know when he left the field an extra time and uh, all of a sudden our counterattacks instead of him just became Kamavinga on the left wing trying to take players on. Uh, I started to like really, really... I don't know if I was taking it for granted or I started to maybe appreciate it more that like it's a totally different team when he's not on the field offensively. Like our, he, is, he is not just... He's not like a Rodrigo threat. Rodrigo's a nice, fine young player who's really good. Happy to have him on the team. Even despite that miss at the end, I still love him. But Vinicius is like a different breed right now. It's a different, completely different kind of threat we have on that wing. And uh, you know what I started to think about when he left the field? I started to think about like, this is what Real Madrid looked like for two, three years after Ronaldo left until this season. This is what we were. We just got a glimpse of like, 5, 10, 15 minutes, whatever left of the game was that Vinicius left the field. But this was our life for so long. Just nothing offensively outside of Benzema. Benzema had no help, and it was really painful to watch. Um, you know, if it, that said, like, we got our attacking opportunities sporadically because Barca really started to chase the game at the end. But, I mean, uh, seeing Kamavinga try to dribble past Araujo was really painful to watch. He just got bullied, um, bullied off the ball. So, yeah, it's a totally different team. Kamavinga just, Kamavinga exists as just, like, the random piece Carlo has to put on whenever he needs to take someone off. Like, I don't know what's really going on with, with the plan with him, but for now, it just seems like he will get minutes. I kid you not, if Benzema, like, gets injured, right? And Jovic has a knock. Ancelotti looks at Mariano, and he's like, you know what? I don't know so much about that. He's going to ask Kamavinga to get up, and we're going to have like five minutes of Kamavinga. Like at this point, it's, it's getting it's getting wild. But I have I have a theory yeah, that I, like before the game, David Ancelotti puts a blindfold on Carlo and spins him around and gives him a dart, and he's like, "Throw this dart wherever it lands. That's the position Kamavinga is going to play today." And then he just plays that. It's never like this consistent. Like this is your role. It's like you're playing the six today. Now you're playing on. Now you. Now you're being. Now you're the the Neymar of the team. Go do that for like ten fifteen minutes, and then we'll see you next game. 
Yeah, in terms of the Vinicius thing, I do not believe the extent to which we were passive defensively would have worked without Vinicius, right? Because it's not that I'm necessarily against like deep blocks and stuff like that, but when you're doing that, you're inviting on so much pressure, you need an absolutely sure release valve to be able to get out of that and also make the opposition think twice about committing players for it, right? Like if we didn't have Vinicius, what that first half possibly could have been was just 45 minutes of Barca having possession in our half, right? It might've been stale possession. They may, might not have created as much as they might've wanted to, but that's still, that, take, that tilts the probabilities significantly in their favor if we're not able to get into their half at all. And without Vinicius, I just don't know how he would have done it as much necessarily. Asensio would have given us stuff. I thought he had decent moments carrying, but honestly, he was best playing off of Vinicius so his ball carrying and movement and getting off into open space, right? It would have been just Benzema carrying us through. Modric, I don't know if as low on him as you were, but it's true that both him and Kroos didn't have the time and space that maybe they'd expect. Like without Vinny, it's really, really hard for me to see how this performance would have worked, but he was there. And it went from a potential where sitting off the way we did might have been too passive to, you know what, we can do that. We can defend like well enough for most of that first half. And then obviously it changed. And we're happy with it because we can get Vinicius out into all this open space time and time again. And if he's not matching up versus Araujo, it's versus Danny Alves, who had like the worst match I've ever seen <laughs> from a professional footballer. Um, I think we need to get to that because you you're gonna you're gonna like murder Diego with that next to those like when you hear the end of it I don't know what his opinion was on that but the way I didn't watch Dani Alves's return match like I, I watched like the last five minutes of that game and the way Kules were talking about it I was like he must have some juice left they were like the return of the king and everything and I was like maybe it's not as ridiculous as I think and then I watched him today and it was zero offensively and Mendy and Vinicius were like just licking their lips when they saw like, that when they were isolated with him, he was just a training cone out there. It was bizarre to see. And then we got a whole thing to talk about with what Xavi did when he subbed him off, because that was even weirder, but I, I don't genuinely don't understand the point of him playing this game. He contributed to absolutely nothing. I don't understand the point of him just playing period. Like I don't, if if you're signing him as like this locker room guy, like a feel good father figure who's going to bring Sergio Dest under his wing, maybe that makes sense. I'm shocked that he's playing any meaningful minutes. What happened in that Granada game was um, he was getting absolutely torched by Darwin Machis in that game, and I tweeted like I think it was not even halftime. I was like, this is cra- this is a crazy situation to me. Like I understand Dest has his liabilities. But he's a good, promising young player. I don't understand how he's taking a backseat to development for this guy who's like, in it. I think uh, Ewan tweeted that he is literally older than Rodrigo Gosha's grandfather or something like that. I don't know. I don't know what. what? The- how is that's not possible? <laughs> how on earth is that possible? Alves is thirty eight. <laughs> what? That doesn't make any. Sense. To be honest, now that I said it out loud, I'm almost like it doesn't make sense either. <laughs> but I'm. <laughs> I think he's older than his father. I think Here we go. The, here's Ewan's tweet, and Ewan's never been wrong about anything. Except for that one time he told me that this Super Cup was going to be played in Sevilla instead of Saudi Arabia, and I nearly booked a ticket to Sevilla, and thank God I didn't. Apart from that, yeah, the tweet is, Rodrigo Gosh comes on and faces 38-year-old Danny Alves, who was one year older than Rodrigo's 37-year-old oh father. Okay. <laughs> Big difference. Jesus Big Christ. difference. <laughs> But it's still, you know what though? If I had to said father first, it's still, it would have sounded pretty dramatic though. It's still a pretty dramatic statistic. Yeah, Alves yeah. is older than Rodrigo's father. I think we can all agree that's still pretty crazy, even though it's not grand. We should just say grandfather moving forward though, see and see how many people believe us. But um, yeah, my, back to my point is like I tweeted like I, this this shouldn't like be the guy who's taking minutes from death. This is, makes no sense. And it was like there was just a bunch of retweets and likes. And like, but just like pretty much silence. And then he had an assist 
in that game to Luke de Jong, and then they started coming. Like, like just like a quiet place when someone makes a noise and the monsters come out of the forest. Everyone, all the Barca fans, frantically started searching Alves on Twitter and just spamming me, like, just like you were saying, blah, blah, blah. Like, and I was like, I was genuinely celebrating their arrival because I knew, like, Literally a, a game later, Vinicius was going to cook this guy, and it wasn't just Vinicius; it was Ferland Mendy on that goal. He's he's a shell of himself. By the way, I actually think he's the greatest right back that has ever played. What's up, Mari D says this is your boy Kian Subani. I hope you enjoyed that free clip we uploaded. That was about thirty minutes or so, and believe it or not, that was about one fourth of the entire episode, which went up late last night over on patreoncom slash Madrid. We went about two hours or so, I think a little bit more than two hours, and we broke down every single detail imaginable, everything from player performances from 1 to 11, plus the substitutions, the decision-making from Carlo Ancelotti, the tactics from both sides, big-picture stuff, post-game quotes, a lot of reflection, a lot of tactics, a lot of big-picture stuff, Q&As with the fans who were on Zoom last night, um, and just a lot of interaction. It's a big Real Madrid family, so I want to congratulate everyone who got in this week and took advantage of the deal where you get two months off the annual membership. That deal is now closed. I told you it wouldn't last forever. Uh, we might do something in the future, but for now, it's closed. You still can get one month uh, free if you buy an annual membership, so it's still a pretty good deal. And look, to be honest, I personally think, uh, maybe I'm biased, but if you get the full 12 months and pay for all 12 months, it's still a pretty damn good deal because it's $3 a month minimum to get inside. That gets you access to the entire back catalog of our content, plus the weekly loan trackers, plus the weekly mailbags, and a bunch of other bonus shows, like the two Champions League postgame shows for the PSG games coming up. Those will be exclusively on patreon.com slash Madrid. So, invite you to come inside Meet the Real Madrid family. Meet the Real Madrid tribe. It's your calling. It's a bunch of like-minded people like you who love the club and just want to take the dialogue and discourse a little bit higher than what you see on Twitter, all the shit posting and trash talking. Although I guess we're not immune from that, but we try to take the dialogue a little bit higher and we invite you on the inside because we love the club like you and we like talking uh, about Real Madrid and the club, all things history, Castilla, Femenino, tactics, you name it. It's all inside patreon.com slash Madrid. See you inside.